again, I'm still figuring out what, what all this means to my life, but I was pretty sure that my life was about to change when I got the phone calls. So uh, when you get an incoming call at 4.40 in the morning from <laughs> Stockholm, that, that's, yeah, that's good news. Well, statistically, I think your lifetime chance of winning the Nobel Prize if you've won the Lasker and the Gerdner is, is maybe 30%. Yeah. But, but I thought that meant in any given year, it was probably one or 2%. So I thought I had a one or 2% chance of winning. So at one or 2%, I could sleep okay, because it was low enough. Yeah. But, I, but I would at least leave my ringer on. Right. So I had my ringer on my, my nightstand. Not only did I not think I was going to be a scientist for many years, I was actually told I should not be a scientist for many years. So I really came to science very late. I thought I was going to be a clinical doctor and I never imagined I would be a scientist. When I was finally in a very good laboratory with a very good mentor, I learned how real science gets done and that gave me the self-confidence being around very good people who were uh, teaching me. So I think then it just becomes a question of do you have the passion to do it because it is hard at times and so you have to enjoy the work. But one of the great joys in life is to have a career where your work doesn't feel like work, it feels like you're playing and for me being a scientist it feels like I'm playing, it doesn't actually feel like I'm working. The self-confidence will come if you're in a good lab and you start to develop some technical skills and you start to understand that maybe I, I do have some talent here and maybe I can come up with some good ideas. And, and, and part of that also is as you start to read and learn more about your field, uh, some of the questions will become obvious, I, I promise. do I think that cancer is curable? So I think the answer is yes, and it's probably gonna be your generation completes the job. But I think cancer is curable. I think you can start to see that we're making progress now that we understand better the genes that are important in specific cancers. The year 2000, when the first draft of the human genome was published. So I, I like to say that working on cancer before the year 2000 was like working on a car without having a, the complete list of the parts. I don't think the clock really started ticking uh, in terms of curing cancer until the year 2000. So when the American president, John F. Kennedy, said we are going to put a man on the moon in 10 years, we put a man on the moon in 10 years. Whereas uh, the American president, Richard Nixon, in the 1970s said, you know, we're going to have a war on cancer and we're still at war with cancer 50 years later. The reason Kennedy could say we can put a man on the moon in 10 years is because all of the scientific principles you needed to know to put a man on the moon were known by 1960. So putting a man on the moon was an engineering problem fundamentally. It was a magnificent engineering problem, but it wasn't really anymore a scientific problem. And that's why you could make some predictions about how long it would take, how many people you would need, how much it was gonna cost. But cancer has still been largely a scientific problem. We're still learning some of the scientific principles. When you're doing a science problem, you can't be quite as sure about how long it's going to take you to get there. So every good experiment and every line of investigation starts with what is the biological question you are trying to answer. And frequently when I ask young scientists what question they're working on, they immediately tell me what experiments they're doing or what technologies they're using, but they don't clearly state what the question is that they hope to answer. And you would be surprised how often, if you force yourself to do that, you will see that, well, maybe this question isn't quite so interesting or important. A good experiment should be pretty and witty. A good experiment should be pretty, like the result is clear and pretty, and you had to be very clever to do the experiment. We don't always achieve that, but that's always our goal. Once an experiment seems pretty obvious to me, and I think other people are gonna do 
the same experiment. I'm, I'm not that interested anymore because why should I do it if it's going to be done with or without me? So we're always trying to look for something that other people haven't seen, ideas that maybe other people haven't had, some new angle or twist that we can bring to bear on a problem. And that's how we, we try to occasionally achieve doing something that's new or more impactful than not. Of course, I'm thrilled, especially as a physician scientist, that there are applications uh, of this work. But I'm fearful that in general, scientists are actually under too much pressure to justify their work in terms of applications. I think everything starts with basic, fundamental, mechanistic work. And if you're really lucky, as you're traveling down the road, you accumulate enough knowledge that you can do something useful. But I'm always a little concerned that there's a lot of understandable enthusiasm about the applications of our work, but I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that my fellow awardees and I were trying to solve what we thought was an interesting biological puzzle. Our assumption was if we solved that puzzle, it might in time lead to applications. But I think all of us would agree you couldn't take any shortcuts. You had to first do the basic work to understand the biology better, which is what we did.